uh, past four months to get it up to 70,000 words and I finished last week. So what I'm going to um, read to you tonight is um, one of my favourite sections from Girl In Between. So to give you a little bit of context, um, it's Girl In Between is about um, a young woman in her early 30s, she's down and out, poor bugger, um, and you know, she's not having a, a good trot in Rocky, and her parents actually um, just say, look, get out of here, we, you know, they shout her on a trip to Japan, basically just because they can't stand the sight of her anymore, she's too gloomy. Um, so I'm going to pick it up here where she is in Japan and she's just um, meeting up with her best friend Rosie from Rocky who has also flown over to have a bit of a hit out in Japan. So here we go. Miraculously, I managed to spot Rosie outside Shibuya Station on the streets of the busiest intersection in the world. We decided to meet here because Rosie wanted us to feel like, feel like we were on Mission Impossible. Although wheeling along her bright pink Samsonite and causing havoc photobombing every second tourist snapshot, Rosie has made the task of my finding her relatively easy. <laughs> Fancy meeting you here, I say, hugging her as she spins around to face me. She's a bit busier than the corner of Fitzroy and Albert Streets loose, she declares, <laughs> taking my arms as we join the throngs of humanity crossing from one corner to the other. How about it, Rosie? I yell, my neck craned at the dizzying spectacle of towering video screens and flashing neon lights. We grin at each other, energised by the electrifying streetscapes. Wow, she exclaims, patting my shoulder as we finally reach the footpath. How fucking good is it to be in Tokyo? I lead her into a brightly lit, fairly crowded sushi train cafe and we squeeze ourselves and her suitcase into contention for the passing plates. Can I buy you a beer as big as your head? I ask. Only if you're buying yourself one too, she replies, smiling. I order our drinks and she high fives me as they arrive. Gee, I haven't seen you wanting to party like this in a while, she, she laughs. Japanese air done you the world of good, has it? Oh, I don't know about the Tokyo air, I reply, but the time I spent up at the Buddhist monastery on top of a mountain in Koyasan was absolutely magic. Oh, she was right, says Rosie, resting her head in her hands. Sounds like, like I got here just in the nick of bloody time. She's always right though, isn't she? What are you talking about, I ask, grinning, knowing the answer deep down. Your mum. She said two weeks for you alone with only your thoughts and the self-help books you've no doubt snuck into your knapsack would be enough to send anyone balmy. I smile at the thought of mum still scheming from 7,000 kilometres away. Told me I couldn't delay one more hour getting in over here, she says taking a large swill of her beer. She even bought me some packing cells from Kathmandu. I laugh, they're actually very useful those packing cells, Rose. Oh Lucy, she says patting my back. Staying in a monastery on top of a mountain with fucking Buddhists. Well, I can tell you right now, I'm cutting all that crap out. For the next week, I'm in charge. I've got it all planned. Anyway, she continues raising her drink. Kenpai! We chink beer glasses as big as our heads and I feel the happiest I've been in 24 months. True to form, Rosie's plans consist of little more than a mud map and a desire to follow the fun. Hence the next day, we find ourselves in the hot spa capital resort city of Beppu, walking into a place we can only decipher as Mud World on Sen. 13 in admission, says Rosie, handing over some crumpled currency to the attendant. Cheap as chips. We stroll under the entry flags into a large labyrinth-like building of corridors and follow the signs to the ladies section, which consists of a bathroom lined with naked women sitting on stools, scrubbing themselves and shampooing their hair, using shower heads connected to wash basins. The onsen bathing rituals are a significant part of Japanese culture, and I'm determined to approach the experience with maturity. Oh shit, Rosie! I exclaim, turning around to find her stark naked. You could have given me some warning! My eyes are downcast. Get your gear off loose, she says, <laughs> sitting down on one of the stools. We have to wash ourselves before we get in the mud. I'm still staring at the tiles. I know, she says, glancing across at me. It makes no sense, but they're not my rules to break, are they? I should have known Rosie would take us to a city that has more than 2,000 on sen. I can tell she's absolutely loving this and delighting in my awkwardness. The water temperature is just divine, she gushes. I turn away from her and strip off my jeans and unfasten my bra. I attempt to stifle a giggle as I chuckle, <laughs> I attempt to stifle a chuckle as I sit behind her and turn on the shower head. 
So how have you been anyway, Luz? She asked casually, soaping up her chest. It's too much for me. I giggle under my breath and she does the same. All right, enough washing, Rosie, I say, turning off the shower head and getting myself together. Let's hit the mud. After you, Luz, she says, looking across at me. No, after you, I say finally, meeting her eye. Oh, she exclaims, you may have been school captain, but you've got no initiative. Follow me. <laughs> we walk quickly out of the bathroom and turn off into a dimly lit cement corridor. Rosie bounds ahead and I hang off her left shoulder, not knowing where to look. We reach the end of the corridor and walk into a brightly lit bathroom full of naked men washing, themse washing themselves. Fuck me! exclaims Rosie <laughs> as some of the men glance up. Turn around! She sputters between gasps of laughter. We've taken a wrong turn! We run back along the corridor with Rosie now trailing me. I've never felt more ridiculous and cannot stop laughing. Rosie has to steady herself at one point along the tunnel and catch her breath. She's laughing that much. Here! I say, pointing to a sign that looks similar to the one printed on our entry ticket. I think if we go along here, we'll... Hello? says Rosie as we emerge from the tunnel into a vast open field of mud. I think this could be it, Luce, she says, looking across at me and grinning. We walk into the muddy expanse, joining dozens of other naked bodies in the centre, all wading around with mud up to their necks. A flimsy rope, strode across the surface, segregates the field into male and female. We lounge about by the rope. Rosie, I haven't been able to stop looking at men's crotches. <laughs> she almost doubles over laughing. Not just today, I'm talking guys on trains, guys walking down the street, young guys, old guys, it's like a disease. She continues giggling. No, I'm serious, it's not funny. Anyway, I say, stretching my arms in the mud. Oh, guess what? I wrote two articles for Tra Travel and Leisure magazine about the Buddhist monastery and cemetery. They're going to print them next month. Oh, that's amazing, Luce. Well done, she says. Yeah, I mean, it's not a gold mine, but they're going to pay me for it. And oh, just felt so good to be writing again. How about your book, she asks. What's the hot sorceress up to? You mean the saucy baroness, I laugh. Yeah, she's back on track, murdering and manipulating people. Rosie rubs mud into her cheeks like it's an exfoliator. I take a deep breath. So, there's something I've been meaning to tell you. She looks across at me. You're moving back to Melbourne. No, you've got a job. No. You're getting back with Jeremy. No, 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 I shake my head. Oscar. Oh, hello, she grins, ceasing her exfoliation. No, Rosie, I don't know if it's an oh, hello or not. Well, continue, please. Okay, well, you know that day I was crying at Bits and Pizzas and he was there with his girlfriend? Well, he came around, our, around to our house after that and was chatting with Max and whatnot and then I chucked a tantrum at Dad and was sobbing in the front yard and he told me that he was sort of into me. <laughs> <laughs> Hang on. Let's get this straight. He told you that he was sort of into you after you chucked a tantrum at your dad and was sobbing in your front yard. Rosie shakes her head in wonder. This is brilliant and it makes you sound 14. <laughs> I know, I conclude, but those were his exact words, Rosie, that he was sort of into me. And then he was all confused and walked off and meanwhile his girlfriend's out with Helen at Bunnings. <laughs> Shit, well that's crap for her. I bet he hasn't told her. No, probably not, so I'm not going to read anything into it. He seems like such a nice guy. It surprises me he would do that. But on the other hand, maybe he really likes you and genuinely is confused. Maybe, but after Jeremy, I don't want to play games anymore, if you know what I mean. I've already wasted too much time. I just want to meet someone who loves me, knows they love me, and that's that. You've got to love them too, though. Oh, of course. Hmm, says Rosie. I know what you're saying, but realistically, anyone we meet now, unless they're 12 years old, is going to have a past. They'll have been with other people, and there's going to be some people that really got under their skin and that they'll always love, and we just have to accept that. So I think we have to be okay with finding someone who may still love someone else, but not be so in love with them that they can't make a happy future with us. <laughs> I stare at her. Bloody hell, that was philosophical. She chuckles and flings mud at me. Well, you've been gone a while, so I've had a lot of time to think. I, gla I gaze around at the sea of bathing bodies. Maybe you're right, Rosie. Actually, I think you are right, but it's a bit depressing. Depressing but realistic, she replies. God, you sound like my dad. I begin to apply a mud mask to my neck. I think I'd prefer to meet a 12-year-old.